perhaps has a deeper view on this than the man who's held pretty much every major cabinet position over the last 40 years. He's now law clerk. Can I call you Ken? Is that OK? Or would you, uh, you can certainly call me Ken. I don't use the absurd title. It's a condition of getting case staying in Parliament and the House of Lords. <laughs> and I, I don't use it in my daily life at all. That makes a lot of sense. Um, how big a deal is the school concrete issue? Oh, it's a very nasty problem, and the last thing that we needed as a country uh, was to have a nasty event like the announcement of two or three weeks ago, uh, which came out of the blue, really. Um, and, obviously, uh, it's very bad news for parents and teachers in particular uh, that we've got now to really speed up getting rid of all this material, not just in schools, actually, but in hospitals uh, and in uh, law courts, in public buildings. Uh, and everybody's having a silly political row about it, whereas nobody's been very bothered about it for the previous 20 years. Uh, and that is because what the event which says it off, and what you never anticipate in politics is events, is the change in the expert opinion three weeks ago. Successive governments were assured there was a problem but it was fixable, that it wasn't dangerous if you could leave it alone unless it started showing signs of crumbling. And three... Uh, ministers don't have... and teachers don't have expertise in concrete. But there was... Three weeks ago, the experts changed their minds. There, and... there were warning signs before on this, though, right? People have warned of the risk for many years well, kind before. of. It didn't really come out Nobody completely got... out of the blue. No, they didn't. Nobody got very excited. That, you, you, people always lobby for more money for education, understandably. That's one of the well, things... Well, if the schools are at risk... If the ceilings no, are at risk of collapsing, ever... that's fair no, enough, Nobody ever put this at the top of their list. You know, you're normally arguing about teachers just pay new schools and but is this is that part of the problem? numbers and so on because you know look teachers pay is obviously a, a big issue but, but the buildings that kids are being taught in matters as well doesn't it that's, that's but, a huge that's deal precisely and until three weeks ago nobody thought the or the experts said the buildings were not dangerous now because of the sort of crazy political atmosphere we have nowadays, which is it's always been pretty crazy, but it's worse now than ever, I think. Uh, at the moment, the experts say, sorry, we're going to have to change our mind. A beam's just fallen down. We've all fallen to uh, our political leaders being advised to turn this into a personal attack on the other party, the other people. I guess... Everybody now is wise after the event. Everybody <laughs> knew it was dangerous. It's all nonsense. Uh, it, it is... Yet another problem facing... It's going to face whoever's in government for the next two or three years. A the sooner we get rid of this material, the better now. Some, it's going to be disruptive. Some people would say that this is a symptom of years and years of underinvestment in no, our No, it's the customness of fate. The, 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 if you'd interviewed an expert... Uh, so a you week, don't a, week, a, a month ago. The, but you were, I, I'm talking about a broader position here. No priorities. You, you, know, you know, you were, you know, in cabinet in the austerity years under George Osborne and David Cameron when there was a squeeze on capital spending, a squeeze on well, long had term. To did there had to be? Did there have to be? Oh, there would have been if the Labour Party had won the election uh, that, that uh, in 2010. Uh, Alison Darling was already preparing an austerity because we'd had the 2008 economic crash. And the real facts which responsible governments have to deal with is the real fact that, that, that our tax revenues had collapsed, we've okay. been borrowing too much, and so whoever won in 2010 had to get public spending under control. Just that, that's say, how grown-up government at this works. This point is a real picture, so I am going oh, to come so, back well, to she, you on some of these she points. She had the uh, good fortune this. of losing, so she's able to say, oh, we wouldn't have done this. Well, somehow how, let's look, Somehow, the huge deficit we were running would have gone let's, away. Let's look, I don't think Alistair would have agreed well, with that, Well, the huge actually. deficit isn't exactly in great shape now either, is it? Well, that's let's, because we spent so much money on COVID, which was talk, another of these disastrous events which hit us. Let's talk about the current economy. How worried are you about the state of the economy? Oh, I'm very worried. I don't think... I think many people have really... A lot of people have not taken on board just how serious the state of the British economy is. Uh, it's whoever, in a way, as I was about to say, is in, unlucky enough to win the next election, faces two or three years of having to do very tough and difficult things. It will take at least that to get back to a healthy economy with what, growth and low inflation. What kind of tough again. things 
need to be done? Well, firstly, continuing to control public expenditure, which is going to be difficult, because you're going to have to have some increases in health spending, because our ageing population has chronic conditions, and increasing numbers and marvellous treatments keep being introduced to deal with it. Must do something about social care. And to get growth going, you've got to do something about skills training and have an industrial strategy. Given you have no money, you have a debt crisis, that is being a big problem. What but about tax? It's been developing for several years, and it will take several years to come. And we, globally, the, the globalised economy is collapsing. Protectionism is coming back. Several other countries are in a debt crisis. Several other countries you, are not making a very good given, job of getting out of it. Given that, what do you think should happen on, ta on tax? Some in your party want to see tax cuts. Are they well, right? you, uh, you would only increase tax from where you are now uh, if you were faced with a desperate situation. And you'd have to really argue you are blue in the face explaining to people why it was in the medium-term national interest. No, no, no politician, any party, particularly a Tory, is going to want to put tax up any further. But, but what you can't do is just do something crazy like cutting taxation when you haven't got any money, you know, go back to trussonomics and say it'll pay for itself somehow. That, that as we saw, plunges you into financial crisis straight away if you do that. It, it, what, what you have to concentrate on is getting rid of inflation and getting back to growth. And the two things I think I would concentrate on are particularly skills training, uh, and I'd also concentrate very much on... We do need an industrial strategy. We're not, not just bailing out failing companies, can't go back to that, but actually having some means of encouraging and incentivising inward investment from abroad as well as investment here again. We've been talking quite a lot about economics on the, on the Politics Hub this week. I spoke to Andy Haldane, uh, the former chief economist at the Bank of England, who yes, sure. was quite critical of the bank. He said they printed money for too long. No, I don't agree with him had... on that. He's a very distinguished man, but I, 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 I think let's, it was too critical. Let's just listen to what happened when the current Bank of England governor, Andrew Bailey, was asked about that interview in Treasury Questions. A former uh, chief economist at the bank, Andy Haldane, was quoted this weekend uh, saying that, in his view, uh, quantitative ease, easing had been had gone on for too long. There had been too much of it uh, in the during the COVID crisis, with the result that the unwinding of QE has now had to be too sharp. Uh, do you share that analysis? Well, Andy said, as I read what he said, and I think he was very careful to say this, that with with the benefit of hindsight or with hindsight, and that is true, of course, he does have hindsight. Uh, as Andy knows well, because he's a former member of the MPC, we don't have hindsight at the point when we make policy decisions. We were so close. We could be like that again. I wish we could be close, but we can't. You got engaged to someone you just met. Why is everyone so hung up on that? You have no idea what your sister is capable of. Your life is in danger. There is ice in your heart. Disney's Frozen the Musical. Book your tickets now. So you've got a bit more sympathy with the current Bank of England governor then? I'm quite critical of the Bank of England, but not for the same reasons. I think they were slow off the mark. Mm. Um, uh, I, I actually think it was absolutely absurd, for, for example, if you want me to criticise them, that we you first... You can say were, what you want, we, we, I don't we, we, we first got to 10% inflation, and we still had interest rates of less than 1%. They were still going in for quantitative easing and pumping uh, money into the economy. So they weren't alone. The ECB and the Fed were a bit late. Uh, but they really were okay. slow off the mark and uh, believed all these theories that it would somehow sort itself out because the Ukraine war would be open over in a few weeks no. and we, 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 it would somehow didn't need their intervention. I think what they've done since is necessary. Um, we've got... You can't get anywhere until you get inflation down to a reasonable level, 2-3%. Uh, and they've um... got to persist with high interest rates for as long as it takes. One last question. I think you probably won't mind me saying that, you know, you've seen quite a few PMs come and go. Quite a lot, yeah. I, I think one of the most, I guess, honest, accurate <laughs> assessments you made was when you were picked up on a microphone uh, on Sky News um, saying Theresa May is a bloody difficult woman, but you and I work with Margaret Thatcher. <laughs> um, is Rishi Sunak a bloody difficult man? 
No, he's a very, very nice man. But, uh, Do you I think, think that's a problem for well, him? That, wait, Do you, you think want, he should be a bit I more mean, difficult? I, I gather I think we're in a serious, serious political economic crisis and a lot's got to go right. And no more, not too many more dramatic events if we're to get out of it over the next three or four years. Don't, don't think that after the election, you know, a few, to, a few gimmicky things will get it all sorted out. It's going to be hard work and it's not going to be popular what governments and banks have to do. We're lucky at the moment, uh, both sides, uh, Keir and Rishi, are nice men, highly intelligent men, very serious, very responsible. Uh, they both put the national interest first. It's about time we had a Prime Minister again who was like that. They uh, both uh, avoid gimmicks. Uh, they're not promising too much because they know the economies in the state that I was talking about. They've got no money. Uh, and they're therefore, and, you know, the fact they know, they're, 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 they're unfortunately their PR people are telling them to try and kick bits of each other to liven it up a bit. Let's talk. But we, we have two responsible people. We'll talk a bit about that. Facing point. enormous problems, worse than any of their predecessors. We'll talk have, a bit about that um, later about some of that advice you were talking about. But I do want to bring in uh, Harriet Harman and Catherine Bubble Singh at this point as well. Um, Harriet, well, I think you'd probably disagree. Uh, it's fair to say with a bit of what um, Ken was saying in that interview. Well, absolutely. For, for a start, I don't think it did come out of the blue because I think that the first warnings were there since 2018 and it has been raised. But I think that what happened today in the House of Commons really will dismay a whole load of people. I thought when three weeks ago that um, this scandal really became very exposed about these crumbling con concrete and postponing children coming back to school, I thought that the Prime Minister would come to the House of Commons on the Monday we got back and say... I've had an emergency meeting with the Home Secretary, the Health Secretary, the Environment Secretary, and I've pulled together all the implications across government departments with the Education Department, and this is how we're going to handle it, and this is the information we're going to give to people, and really get a grip on it and then explain how we were going to go forward. Instead, we have him coming into Prime Minister's questions on Wednesday and saying not all schools are affected and um, Keir Starmer is just jumping on a political bandwagon and uh, doing political opportunism. And I think as Prime Minister, you've got to tell the country what you're doing about something which is a problem and nobody was any the wiser and I think he's got a new and very inexperienced Secretary of State for Education who seems to have bounced everybody in other government departments. So goodness knows what's going to happen in health buildings and in prison buildings and in higher education buildings. So I'm afraid this is more of the kind of shambles which, on the one hand, you know, Labour in opposition is supposed to be, you know, taking advantage of this, but it's really depressing to see that it's a shambles from a Prime Minister who was supposed to be, after Liz Truss, a safe pair of hands, but the hands don't seem to be gripping it. It wasn't you, um, Harriet, they're referring to a story broken by Sam Coates that she, Gillian Keegan, Education Secretary, acting unilaterally, and no one's really sure what this means for all sorts of other uh, buildings uh, in public ownership. Um, Catherine, I was quite interested by something you said to me uh, just before we came on air about the implication for kids about not going into school. Because, look, we've got technology. Some people might be saying, what's the problem? They can just learn on Zoom. Yeah, and I would disagree with that. Nothing beats a good teacher in a classroom. Yeah. And children need, I always say, to be held to account. It means that you can test them in, when they're in front of you. If you're online, you can't do any of that because, well, they can cheat quite easily. In fact, they can just leave a black box up and go off and eat the dinner while you think you're actually teaching them. So, yeah, I, I do worry very much about the children who aren't in school right now. And it, it is infuriating that it's happening now at the beginning of the year when it's just the most important time for children being in school. So, um, yeah, my concerns go to the families, really, and the children who, who aren't accessing their, their education. Um, I also wonder what your take is on... Because, look, school budgets are under pressure. You know, Ken was just saying that, you know, there's always going to be people saying that, look, we need to focus on staff wages, for example. Do buildings matter? Yes, they do matter. Um, although I take what Ken Clark is saying, you know, you, you just can't keep spending and spending and uh, there has been waste in the past. And so I understand government wanting to cut back. Um, and the, the other thing, what Ken 
Clark is pointing to is the fact that sometimes when dealing with things in with government and schools and so on, things can be very slow and, and the bureaucracy, it can all take a very long time. And so-called experts come in and say one thing one moment and then they say another thing and the next moment. I mean, I think about asbestos at the moment, for instance, is fine apparently and as long as you don't disturb it. But what happens when in three years they say, oh my goodness, a new expert comes in and says, right, <laughs> any school that has any asbestos uh, is in serious danger. Well, that might take out most schools in, in the country. I don't know. You know, it's, um, it, it, he, 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 I think he made a lot of good points on That's that. That's really interesting. Um, Harriet, what's your take on Labour and spending commitments? Because there's obviously a, a very kind of strict spending envelope that the Chan Shadow Chancellor is then looking at. But do you think that actually Labour, do you agree with that? Or do you think that actually Labour needs to look at saying that they are willing to borrow a bit more money or spend a bit more money if they do win the next election? Well, I think um, Rachel Reeves, the Shadow Chancellor, and Keir Starmer are absolutely right to give people the confidence that there's going to be fiscal, financial...